Dobar dan. Good morning everybody. I'm uh, Sabina Vosani and I'm here on behalf of uh, the New Zealand Institute for Plant and Food Research and I would like to talk about the preliminary results regarding the vibrational communication of the plant hopper Scolipopa australis. So, uh, we, uh, I worked at the biosecurity department at uh, Plant and Food Research in Lincoln, a small town close to Christchurch in the South Island of New Zealand. And we were uh, working on the passion wine hopper Scolipop australis, which is an emipteran insect belonging to the Ricanidae family, which is called ballerina because it has a graceful swinging gait when walking. And it, uh, it is a polyphagous flowing feeder, so it can feed on hundreds of plants. And it was introduced in New Zealand in the recent past from Australia. It is present currently in both North and South Island, especially below uh, 500 meters. Uh, it has generally one generation per year. So in uh, New Zealand, obviously, it overwinters as egg uh, during winter. So starting from fe uh, February, the eggs are laid inside plant stems. And then nymphs start to hatch in September. And uh, they are called fluffy bumps because they are lovely uh, plant hopper nymphs with uh, a long tail. And uh, adults start to emerge in December and completely disappear in May. So we have just uh, a small amount of time to work on these insects. And they are quite big, like around five, eight millimeters. But nothing or there is less is known regarding the behavior of these insects. They have an aggregative uh, behavior, so we can find high dense colonies on the plants with both nymph and adults. And they seem to be uh, more active at dusk. So in the evening, uh, the, you can observe mating and egg laying behaviors. However, uh, communication modalities are still unknown. So, but why should we study the passion wine hopper? Because in New Zealand, it has an economic importance. In fact, due to feeding, it produces large amount of honeydew on uh, plants. So um, stimulating the growth of sooty mold, mold. And for this reason, uh, kiwi fruits are rejected. And given that there is zero tolerance for pesticide residues on uh, kiwi fruits because uh, they have a um, uh, furry skin, so you cannot treat the plants when the fruits are uh, on uh, the plant. Uh, so the honeydew produced by the passion wine hopper is costing to the kiwi fruit industry more than 70 uh, millions of New Zealand dollars uh, of the losses per year. It's a really a lot of amount of money. And in addiction, uh, as you can see from the pictures, um, the insect uh, causes also direct damages on the plant by feeding, but also by uh, uh, causing oviposition scars on the plants. Here you can see you know, crosses, sooty molds on plants and on uh, uh, the fruits. Better. So our questions were, could vibration help the kiwi fruit industry in New Zealand, given that we know that Akenorincas use vibration to communicate? Can we demonstrate that also the ballerina sing? And there is any kind, there is any room for vibrational pest control against this insect? So to answer to this question, we set up a, a vibrational laboratory in a, at the plant and food research. But given that we started the experiments during the pandemics, I could not, be fl could not fly to New Zealand, so I just gave support from abroad. Just a help in supporting the experimental setup. And we set up two kinds of trials. A single trial where we were recording single males and single females to assess the spontaneous emission of vibrational signals. And uh, we tested young males and a little bit older females because we observed uh, from preliminary studies that the female seems to be uh, to need more time to reach the sexual maturity. And we also uh, studied male-female pairs to assess the mating process. 
Unfortunately, due to the pandemic restriction, we could only perform experiments from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And given that the insect is more active at dusk, uh, it was not really a good choice, but we were obliged. Even so, we could record vibrational signals and uh, we analyzed them. Uh, we analyzed the timing, so the time of the day when the signal occurred, but also the latency, so the time from the insect release to the first emission of a signal. Then we also tried to characterize the calling signal in terms of length, number of pulse strains, and the dominant frequency and the amplitude of the pulse strains, especially selecting at the beginning and the end of the calling signals. And what we observe is that both males and females spontaneously emit calling signals. 25% of males and more than 36% of females tested call it in the, within the 30 minutes of trials. And four of uh, 12 pairs that were uh, tested exchange, exchanged <laughs> vibrational signals, even if none of them really established a vibrational duet that led to mating. So, they were communicating, but we never arrived to see a uh, mating achieved by the male. So we still have no idea how mating occurs. Here I would like to show you a male that is calling for the female. So graceful ballerina, but really not the best singer, maybe. Is if you look at the abdomen, you can see that the, it's contracting. So it's probably related to the production of vibrational signal by the male. And here, a representation of the male signal. As you can see, is a long series of pulse strains, which is uh, composed of longer uh, pulse strain at the beginning of the signal, which are rather low amplitude. While at the end of the signal, there are a, l a higher amplitude pulse strains and a little bit shorter than uh, at the beginning of the song. The female, on the other hand, has two types of calling signal. The type one is the more frequent one. It's always composed of pulse strains, but as you can see, they are not so regularly dispersed, interspersed like the male's one. They are brief at the beginning and a little bit longer at the end. And they have a less regular structure compared to the male. The type 2 signal, uh, it's not really maybe a signal, but because we observed it just four or five times in different females. And it's just a very regular emission of pulse, of brief pulse strains but we have no idea of the function of this kind of signal. Here, on the other hand, we can see the exchange of male-female signal. As you can see, they uh, tightly synchronize their pulse strains. They uh, never overlap, and they are emitted one after each other by the female and the male. Again, we have no idea if this is the duet that will lead to mating, because we never observe uh, a mating or even the a vibrotaxi, so the male that could go over the female following these uh, signals. But maybe we just needed more time. If we plot uh, the latency, the length, and the number of pulse strains of the male and female calling signal, we can see that the latency is way higher in males compared to females. And uh, the length and the number of pulse strains is also high in the male compared to the female. Here is just a, um, the plot one against, in, uh, against each other because due to the low number of replicates, we didn't want to do any statistical really inference regarding the, the signals. But at least it's um, a good suggestion that the, uh, the latency, the length, and the number of pulse strain is higher in the male. On the other hand, if we plot the length, the dominant frequency of the pulses at the beginning and the end of the male and female signal, we can see that probably there is not really a significant difference between each other. So even at the beginning and the end of the signal, they are similar within the male, but also between the male and the female. But again, we will need more replicates to confirm this hypothesis. If we plot the number of, uh, record, the number of calling signals that we recorded 
against the time of the day, we can see that there is a um, trend uh, toward the end of the day, so in the evening or late afternoon, males and females were calling more compared to in the morning. Again, confirming that probably the plant bashing wine hopper has a more uh, evening uh, activity, so that maybe in the evening we can we will observe a higher number of callings, a higher number of uh, duets. So to conclude. The passion wine hopper, we demonstrated that the passion wine hopper produces vibrational signals that both male and females can call when spontaneously, uh, spontaneously when singularly placed on the plant, and that the signal latency is lower in the females, so that they are probably the first emitted uh, emitters. And uh, we observed that males and females call more in the evening, so confirming again that these insects should be tested more <laughs> in the evening. And, uh, but we will need more data regarding the duetting and the performation process. And we will perform tests in, uh, in the late noon or at least with insects that will be treated to mimic evening condition with growth chambers. We will also study uh, the aggregation of the signal. So if vibration are used to by nymphs and the adults to find each other and aggregate on plants. And then we will perform playback trials to see if we can find vibration able to disrupt mating, disrupt feeding, or to be attractive, so to develop vibrational traps or repellence uh, signals. And we have a PhD of the Canterbury University, Mark, Mac, Mark McDougall. And the aim will be to develop um, a repellent or disrupting stimuli to be applied to the kiwi plants, similarly uh, to what has been done with the vibrational vineyard developed by the team of uh, uh, Dr. Mazzoni at Fondazione. Because as you can see in this picture, kiwi fruits are trained by wires so there are poles, there are wires that we can use to transmit the vibrations. So I would like to thank our funding agency, Tom Sullivan, Christina Rowe for their valuable support and you for your attention. Here the team. <laughs>